Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace, and this is our week on war. We've done three episodes so far. We've talked about why we love war and history of war, and we've also talked about tactics and how they've changed and also kind of stayed the same, so make sure you check those out. But today we're gonna talk about some of the long-term effects of war. War affects people on and off the battlefield. It will affect the physical as well as the emotional and the psychological. Long-term health problems for soldiers following wars is not a new thing. I mean, we hear a lot about it now, but it's been something that's been going on forever. We actually noticed and really began documenting it early on in the last century. In the First World War, they started saying something called shell shock was affecting soldiers. It was a syndrome originally believed to have a physical origin. It was caused by reaction to loud shelling, and they kind of never recovered from that. The belief changed once they realized that soldiers who had never been around loud shelling also developed similar symptoms. Since it's a, they then realized it's a psychological syndrome, they really didn't know what to do. There was very little sympathy for people who were shell-shocked, both during the battle and also later, and once they got home. They didn't really know what to do with these shell-shocked soldiers. People had never really talked about it before. During World War II, they started testing recruits prior to going to war to see if they were susceptible to shell shock. They tested a recruit to determine their ability to handle stressful situations. They wanted to see if they would be a viable recruit. According to sciencemuseum.org, a number of men and women were actually discharged from the armed forces in World War II after they were considered to be unsuitable for the military on these grounds. A lot of soldiers experienced high levels of stress in battle. I mean, it's kind of part of battle is stress. And they ended up calling this high level of stress condition battle fatigue. And a soldier found with that condition was then removed from battle and they were sent somewhere to rest behind the lines. And obviously every person has a limit to the amount of stress that they can endure. And a lot of people hit that limit in World War II. And today we have a name for it, post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD. But that didn't come around for a while after World War II. Even soldiers who went to Korea, to Vietnam, they were still unsure what was going on with these people and these psychologically affected men and women until in the 1980s, the American Psychiatric Association added PTSD to the third edition of the DSM, the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So DSM-3, today we're at the DSM-5, so they've really made some revisions. But it was pretty controversial when it was first introduced. The DSM is the standard manual for all mental health practitioners as to how to code or organize all of these different mental health disorders. There's obviously a lot of controversy around it, but it is the standard manual. And people were worried that medicalizing this shell shock disorder would cause people to be dependent and you'd label it as a disease and Nobody then knew what to do with it. Similar debates have raged often throughout the history of mental health in our communities. It's, is addiction an affliction? Is it a disorder? Is it a disease? Or is it just a personal weakness? Depression, is that a disorder, a disease, a personal weakness? Obesity, a disorder, a disease? These are debates that are constantly going on, and one of them was PTSD. The addition of PTSD to the DSM filled a very important gap in psychiatric theory and practice, and it was one of the first diagnoses to move the causal factor outside of the individual. They weren't being caused by something going on here. They weren't weak. It wasn't their own problem. It was this trauma that was going on around them. The neurobiology of PTSD is really telling. It's very interesting. So many things are happening in the brain and elsewhere in the body. And Research shows that PTSD may be associated with neurobiological alterations in both the central and autonomic nervous systems. The central nervous system is the one you think of when you think of the nervous system. It's the brain and all of this. The autonomic nervous system are things that you don't control consciously. Psychophysiological changes also occur in the people who have PTSD. For example, the sympathetic nervous system, which is you know, how you breathe and things that keep your heart beating, can be hyper aroused in people with PTSD. You're not controlling that, that's not you, that's your body. Increased sensitivity and augmentation of the acoustic startle eye blink reflex is aroused in PTSD, which means that you startle more easily and you'll blink more easily when startled. There are sleep abnormalities associated with PTSD. Everyone knows that that's not something you're consciously controlling. Functional brain imaging in modern day suggests there's 
Excessive amygdala activity in people with PTSD. The amygdala is the fear center of the brain. It controls a lot of our emotions. And there is also reduced activation of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex is executive function. It's how we make our decisions. And the hippocampus is memory functioning. So people with PTSD can have all sorts of problems with emotions, with decision making, with memory. And all of those things seem to fit with shell shock, if you think back, you know. Lots of things are happening inside the body, but it's important to understand what triggers this as well. To understand PTSD, you have to understand the concept of trauma. According to the DSM-3, which again has been revised since, a traumatic event is a catastrophic stressor that is outside the range of usual human experience. War would definitely fit into that, but so would a lot of other things, you know? Torture and rape, the atomic bomb going off near your hometown, in your hometown. Natural disasters also fit there. Earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, and also more emotional things. Human-made disasters, factory explosions, airplane crashes, automobile accidents. I mean, even just losing a partner, losing somebody, can, that can be a traumatic event that you never recover from. You can have PTSD from that. It's very interesting, and it can happen to so many people. Everyone has stressors in their lives. And to diagnose PTSD assumes that most individuals can cope with ordinary stress. And the traumatic stressors overwhelm our capacity to handle that stress, and thus we get post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't want to just focus on people in war, of course, even though this is our week on war. Civilians can have PTSD too, and they can be affected by war even when they're not directly involved. There's collateral damage where people are literally hurt or killed. But there's also civilian populations who have to deal with the fallout, the destroyed infrastructure, leftover mines and bombs that still exist all over the world from various conflicts. And long-term health effects. People living outside of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had problems with radiation sickness, physical injuries, specific medical problems that maybe were associated with it, but they didn't always know. Medical facilities and infrastructure were so damaged that people may have had to resort to things that could have caused trauma. And on top of all that, it's not just the adults out there, you know, fighting or protecting their homes or, you know, searching for food. It, it also can be children. One study looked at the long-term effects of war experiences on children's depression in the Republic of Croatia. They studied almost 600 children aged between only 12 and 15 years, so only a three-year span. And they found that 283 of those children were displaced from different parts of Croatia for a period of approximately three and a half years. And those children with more war experiences had more depressive symptoms in boys specifically. It's just one study, but it shows that you don't necessarily have to fight in a war in order to be affected by it. PTSD can affect soldiers, can affect people, it can affect civilians all across all of our communities. And I want to end on this section with a personal anecdote. I've been reading this book recently, so I, it's personal as in I'm doing this now. Um, James Bond, Ian Fleming. The book is You Only Live Twice. And in this, it's post Casino Royale, spoiler alert, his lady gets killed at the end of Casino Royale, the movie, also in the book, not good. Um, and James Bond is being described by M to a neurologist with the symptoms of PTSD. They're saying he can't focus. He doesn't have great memory of what he's been doing lately. He doesn't show up on time. He's inattentive. He's failing at work and he doesn't have an emotional response to anything anymore. Sounds a lot like PTSD but they didn't have language when that book was written to describe what it was. And instead, the neurologist in the book says, oh, just send him out on a very important mission and he'll perk right up. Because people didn't understand how to deal with people who'd been through these traumas. But no one's gonna think James Bond is a weak guy. They talk about it in the book. They're like, no, he's a strong man. He should be able to handle it. And that's the problem is, Without an understanding of what's going on, we don't really have a language to describe it. If you think you might know someone with PTSD, there are resources available, by the way. PTSD.va.gov is the Veterans Affairs Administration. They have great resources if you want some information further than this podcast. And there's also the National Center for PTSD. That's part of the VA as well. So I know this one was a little bit of a downer, but PTSD is very kind of mysterious for a lot of people. It's not very well understood. Tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about the future of warfare, cyber warfare. 
Computers fighting computers. Well, actually people using computers to fight computers. It's gonna be cool. Make sure you come back for that. Subscribe to TestTube Plus. Come find me on Twitter if you have questions. I'm at Trace Dominguez. You can find the show at TestTube. Let us know down in the comments what you thought of this episode. I know, again, kind of a downer, but I think it was really, really interesting. Hopefully you agree. Thanks for watching TestTube Plus. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh.